I'm glad there's at least like some business representation as well. That's fantastic. Um, cool. And I guess I'm last in the AI series again this year. Is that right? Yes, you are. Okay. So what do you all know about this AI thing and this machine learning thing? You, Osborne came in. You talked to Rich, right? And others? No, we haven't had Rich, but we've had three lectures from Osborne. Okay, so what do you know because of Osmar? So I can either completely kind of be what my excellent colleague has said or to, uh, to reinforce some of those lessons. What has he already told you? What are some of the key lessons? No one's learned anything. Oh, please, yes, thank you, thank goodness. <laughs> um, I guess the devices we use every day are constantly applying machine learning to collect data about us and do things like Add personalization or uh, content recommendations. Cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Anyone have, have more examples? I, I like that we started this way. Does anyone have more examples of ways that, that machine learning systems or machine intelligence has been used in, in things like. Oh, yeah, okay, great. Um, it's been helping out in terms of medicine, like finding out the success rate, I think it was, of like different drugs in, or the recurrence of certain diseases in people based on yep. previous data. Um, and then also, like, there's, it, we learned a lot about like AlphaGo and like the different um, like games oh, okay. and stuff. It was really cool. Good in the AlphaGo and everything. Okay, great. I'm still trying to. Oh, hey, this looks promising. Cool. We we actually sparked up. That's great. Um, so you can run presentations off your phone. I did so for the board of the governor, uh, governors of the Glen Rose just last week. Okay, cool. So any other examples before I dive? I mean, this is sort of the topic I'm going to talk about today, roughly and largely. Um, so I think it sort of rolls out of that last comment. What other things? What other things did you already find out that? That, okay, this is promising peril, isn't it? Um, what were some of the, like, the best things that, that Osmar talked about in terms of, of the utility of adaptive intelligence systems machine in the modern age? I was like, no, there's no promise whatsoever. I actually don't like the auto recommenders. They're really bad most of the time. Those text to speech systems always screw me up. Um, Okay, so no promise whatsoever. I'll, I'll just ride with that one. How about Paris? Uh, what were some of the, the ethical considerations or some of the challenges that, that you've talked about so far? Again, so I can, can build on them as I talk today. Just, cool, um, please. Security and how um, so much of our information and daily habits are getting out there and companies are using it and if we should be okay with that or not and how detrimental is that to us really? Hashtag Facebook. <laughs> sorry, I'm on camera. I guess I'll say controversial things on camera. Uh, cool, sorry, there's another suggestion. You have, you have more suggestion as well. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, for promises that, uh, like for example, the AlphaGo project, um, they created a bot that could surpass human ability, I guess, in that region. And then I think it quickly kind of expanded to, because the idea of it was like to give it a set of rules and then it just kept on learning more than we ever knew. And so I guess that's the, it's a good and bad thing, or it depends who you ask, but, um, about how AI can potentially learn more than no. <laughs> or different things. I, I also, okay, so I really am going to touch on that. La that last point's a great bouncing off point because I'll touch on that later on. Um, uh, the interesting thing about AlphaGo is that there's there's many different iterations of it. And, and one interesting thing was that the first the first sort of uh, thing you may have seen about AlphaGo was was a system that played first starting to learn based on how human professionals played. As it, as AlphaGo turned into things like Alpha Zero all of the, the prior information was removed. And so the system could start to, just through playing itself, begin to learn things about the rules and the dynamics of the game, and also to be able to build strategies and ways of playing the game that were perhaps even not limited by the original human trajectory. So that was a, that was a cool thing, and we, we see this happening in many different ways. Okay, that was awesome, thank you. I, I, just, I liked that little poll, especially because I usually come later in the term, mainly because I'm bad at both finding rooms and scheduling. Um, but I usually come later in the term, so I want to know what, what Osmar has already told you, and if Rich talked to you, clearly I'd like to know that too. So I'm going to talk to you largely about this topic today, uh, which is artificial intelligence and medicine, but really I'm going to try to drill down into some of the nuts and bolts of my view on intelligent systems, which hopefully is complementary to what you've heard already, and then look at three main ways that machine intelligence and, and intelligent systems technology is interacting with medicine currently and in the future, 
And then a little bit of a, a forecast, especially because we do have people in the room that, that relate to the various fields of squishy, squishyology, um, that we can actually look at a little bit at ways in which we might expect our fields, especially the fields of medical practice, to change in the next five to 10 years. Is that cool? Um, I, I think I have an Amy slide here. Does anyone, did everyone, did Osmar introduce you to Amy already? No? Oh my goodness, I have to go have a talk with Osmar. Um, so if, if you don't know Amy, which sounds like everyone don't, does not know, uh, we have the Alberta Machine Intelligence here in Alberta. It's one of the world leading centers for machine intelligence research, especially a kind called reinforcement learning. Um, it, it has a, a number, this isn't even actually, I have to update my slides, this is not all of the different fellows, the different principal investigators associated with the institute. But what this means for you is that if you have if you have projects, if you have ideas, if you have businesses that you might start that are going to integrate with intelligent systems technology or, or AI technology, um, there are a large number of people in the province and in fact in this city that are going to be able to engage with you to help you flesh out those ideas, to better understand your own ideas and your own, your own problem and data, and also help you to connect with other great people who might be able to take your ideas in to make them a reality. So I want to point out that we do have Amy here. It makes us special. Edmonton is one of the top places in the world for AI research, and we often are really bad about actually crowing about that. We're not good at, at, at sort of tuning our horn, and so I try to do that every now and then when I remember. Um, okay, so back on the main topic of the talk today. Uh, because I'm really probably not qualified, to, despite being in the Department of Medicine, not qualified to talk about this broad topic, um, I'm going to drill back down, in fact, to something I do feel qualified to talk about, which is how artificial intelligence and machine learning impact thinking, moving, and perceiving. Uh, many of the things that are sort of rolled together within the subdiscipline of physiatry, uh, one of the divisions of, of medicine which I am actually based in. So we're going to talk more about AI with respect to thinking, moving, and perceiving, but we're going to then, we'll, we'll sort of snowball that back out again to medicine at large. Okay. I have a few learning objectives because I actually think it's helpful to define these. One is by the end, I really hope that um, you'll be able to, maybe you can already do this, be able to define artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and in, in doing so, be able to define some of, not just at a high level, but also define some of the characteristics of intelligent systems technology. Because it's relevant here, I'd love that you'd be able to also say how technologies from the field of AI have been applied in medicine, especially to, because of the content I'll provide, things like the muscles and the nerves. The big piece, though, and the last two that I, I think are important, I mentioned earlier, is that I also really hope to be able to, by the end of the next, like, say, hour, I have an hour and 20 minutes as usual, yeah. right? Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, be able to start to think very hard about how these emerging technologies are going to impact your own life, your own practice, your own study, the kinds of, the kinds of ideas you might cultivate, the science or research you might do, the businesses you might start in the next five to 10 years. So that's part of the bottom line there. Um, and I'll give you some resources, mainly links to cool videos online, actually, I'm going to be very honest, um, to actually help you, help you do future study. Cool. So, I'm going to jump right in to the cool videos, because again, this is, this is why we're here. And I think many of you may have seen this, especially those in neuroscience. Show of hands, maybe who's seen this, this particular video? Okay. So. You lectured on neuro two times, I remember. Oh, uh, you're going to, am I giving you the same lecture you've already heard? Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Was that the time that I actually just randomly picked a lecture? I'm not sure. I still have the lecture slides, actually. Okay, it could be this one. I don't know. Usually, I, I give like two two hundred adventure talks when I go give to Neuro Two Ten, and yeah. never gets really upset because then it's on the final exam and they, they hate me for it. Okay, so you've probably heard this talk. Maybe you should just I don't know. Go check the interviews or have fun or do something. Um, either way, I'll, I'll I'll say this again then for everyone for everyone else who hasn't seen it before. Um, this is a, a video of a participant down with the BrainGate project down in the states and. She is paralyzed from the neck down. This is Jan Sherman. She can't move her body below the neck. And what you'll notice here is that Jan is using signals from her brain. There's these two gray plugs in the top of Jan's head. She's using signals from her brain to control that robot arm. She's projecting herself out into the world by way of this robot arm to feed herself a chocolate bar. If we go later on, you'll see her like eat silly string, like the cheese strings, or fist bump the doctor, um, put objects on a, on a shape wall. So again, Jan, Jan can't move her body below the neck. But through the use of this brain interface technology, she's able to project her intent out into this robot arm and control it to feed yourself a chocolate bar. I think this is spectacular. I just I always like to open with this particular example because it's very much like, oh wow, it's like the Matrix. People are using plugs in their brain to control machines. Um, it is really spectacular. We've come a long way as a species in deploying fairly advanced technologies for linking humans and machines together. This is one of the great examples of that. 
Oh, and by the way, if you want examples of these slides, you can just go look on my website. It's Polarski. At, if you look for Polarski at Yoburn, you'll find my site. And uh, there's a slide deck in PDF form there. So you can grab all these slides. So you can probably not even worry about taking lots of notes. You can just go look at the slides later. Um, cool. OK, so we often see technologies of the, of the latter form. We see technologies where someone might be projecting their, their intent into a robot that is physically separated from their body. This, uh, this by contrast, is a, another form of assistive technology that we're also seeing starting to be considered, conceptualized, and in some cases brought into practice. This is the idea that you might, instead of just replacing a part of the body that can no longer be controlled by the brain, that when a piece of a brain itself has been damaged, a part of the central nervous system has been damaged, that we might in fact be able to replace whole modules of the brain that are lost. So this is work by uh, Theodore Berger and some of his colleagues, and they, they have a company that relates to this as well. But the idea is that, like, imagine that part of the brain was lost, say, through to traumatic brain injury. Could we actually use, use systems, use technology to model the part of the brain that was lost, implement it in software and in silicon, and then use it to replace that piece that was, that was somehow removed from our, our, our normal biological processing? Uh, one example might be the consolidation of short-term experiences into long-term memory. If someone can't do that for themselves, can we actually model how the signals in the brain that flow from our short-term experience into long-term storage, can we model how that process is constructed so that the brain can continue to, with the assistance of technology, take short-term experiences and turn them into thoughts that can be stored down the road? So this is one example of, and this is, like, it sounds a lot like science fiction. Whoa, we're actually replacing parts of the brain tissue with computational models. Uh, but there are people who are seriously considering this and building companies around this. So, other examples, this is closer to the, the work I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis in the lab. Uh, this is a video, of course, from, from Johns Hopkins, who are one of the leaders in prosthetic technology. And we can also imagine machines that aren't connected directly to the central nervous system, but are in some way connected to the peripheral nervous system. So, downstream of the brain and the, and the spinal cord, you can imagine connecting robotic limbs, wheelchairs, other body parts uh, to signals that might be happening in the nerves that are downstream from the spinal cord or to muscles and parts of the skin, essentially allowing machines to sample the intent of people from more remote or distributed parts of the human body. Okay? Uh, one of the most compelling examples, I, I like to show this particular example, is in fact osseointegration. So if you can see up here, like you, you look here, uh, this individual has a prosthetic limb, but unlike the usual prosthetic limbs that are sort of strapped onto the body with, with cables and harnessing solutions, he has an implant in the bone of his residual limb, such that this arm is actually mechanically affixed to the bone structure of his body. So metal is inserted into the bone, and this prosthetic limb actually clip locks into his own bone structure. So now that robotic arm is attached to his body in a very, uh, very responsive, physically, physically active way. He can still control it using signals from his body. Here he's controlling it using signals um, from these little black bands. But researchers in Sweden and Australia have been also been looking at ways that you might start to string wires through that socket into the bone structure, out of the bones, to connect inside the body to muscles and to nerves. So this is a way to begin to very tightly and intimately connect people and the machines that support them in their daily life. Another example, I'm just going to keep showing you a few rapid fire examples before we, we shift gears here. Um, earlier, we had a look at Jan Sherman, who is, who is using signals from her brain to control the motion of a robot arm. It's also realistic to think that, well, you know, we, we still have a body below a spinal cord injury. Maybe you can use signals from the brain to begin to control that body that no longer is connected to the brain in any appreciable way. And that's what they do now at the Cleveland FES Center. Here, here is just one example of where signals sampled from the brain can be used to electrically stimulate nerves and muscles in the body below the spinal cord injury, such that, in essence, someone can remote control their own body. They can begin to drive their own body through the world by very, very, uh, like, very elegantly stimulating parts of the body using activity from their brain. What's really neat about this is you can think of it as almost like running a supplementary nervous system. It's like, well, you know, we can't use the nervous system we have. Some people are also looking at jumping the brakes in the spinal cord, mind you. But if you can't, they're like, oh, well, why don't we just string a new nervous system to activate the muscles and the nerves that no longer are connected in an appreciable way to the brain. Um, you don't need wires. I showed wires in that last slide. There's new technologies as well that are looking at just implanting devices, maybe the size of a grain of rice, in the muscles and in the nerves, such that they can wirelessly connect to each other and just into recording devices outside the body to allow a much more straightforward interface. Um, devices like the ones being shown here have been shown to be long-term stable in, in people for many, many years. 
So to be able to actually have devices that just ride around your muscles, the body's more or less fine with it, and then they can record information from your muscles as you move around. So instead of having to, say, strap a prosthesis onto someone's arm and put a few electrodes, you might imagine just implanting things directly in the body that can inform the control and feedback from electromechanical devices that support people in daily life. Yeah, please. And you said for a few years, as in like, they have to replace it after? Yeah, so I think, and maybe don't quote me on this because I'm not sure of the exact numbers. My, re my recollection was that they've shown that these particular devices were, these are the IEs, that they were stable for over 10 years. Um, after that point, then, yeah, you might have to replace them. There's a whole, like, Pandora's box of, hey, what happens when you have implantable technologies and they're no longer doing their job? pacemakers, etc. cetera, um, that, that, anyway, that opens a very interesting line of discussion. You're like, oh, well, who's responsible for taking them out? Uh, is it the person who put them in? Is it the health system? Uh, is it the person with, like, I don't know, tweezers? Like, <laughs> how do we get those things out and put new ones in? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Good. Um, okay, cool. There's other forms of interaction with the, body, the brain and the body. Here you can see someone that's uh, using a brain-computer interface, a EEG cap, so monitoring electrical potentials from the scalp to work with a wheelchair to navigate an environment. This is from uh, Jose Della Milan and some of the folks in Switzerland that, from their team. Uh, there's people now that are wearing devices that will learn patterns of the body so that they can actually interpret them for control of, say, a prosthetic hand. Those are commercially available devices. A lot of what I showed you before uh, those were research examples. These were things that existed in research labs around the world. Uh, this system here is, is doing many of the same operations, but it's commercially available. There's a company in the States called Coapt, and now a number of other companies that are looking at, at deploying advanced computing technologies to interface machines to the people that they, they help. And I guess you could also just go to any of your favorite big box stores, and okay, so Mayo is currently off the market, it's bought by someone else. Um, but it, 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 as of only a, a few months ago, you could go to any like big box stores and drop 200 bucks and have a device that would sample information from your body and you could use it to control your, like, your, your notes or I could control my slideshow with it or a little robot rolling around the world. So what used to be hundreds of thousands of dollars of like research hardware, arguably people can go and buy for a couple hundred bucks now in a consumer capacity as opposed to something that you have to get through some privileged biomedical channel. Um, okay, so here's the big point. The reason I showed you all of those examples the only reason I showed you, besides the fact that they're super cool and I like showing videos in my talks, um, is that every single example I showed you use some form of machine intelligence or machine learning. So the glue, the thing that actually put the person together with the assistive machine was, yes, wires and, and yes, all sorts of little maybe patches that are put on the skin. But the thing that, that actually made the tight connection between all of those people, all of those assistive machines, was some kind of machine intelligence the piece of software that learned about the signals from the muscles of one of those prosthetic users and mapped them to control commands for that robotic joint, the signals that flow from that little black bio band that I showed you on the last slide that you can use to control your laptop or your computer. Machine learning algorithms, machine intelligence algorithms are forming that interface. They're forming that fundamental link between the human body and the assistive machines that are supporting that human body. Okay, does that, does that make sense? This is really one of the key sort of points of my talk is that this is like, as I asked you, hey, where's machine learning being used already? This is already happening. I mean, this happens as well in those other devices that were noted. Your cell phone is like learning to better autocorrect. Your various technologies, your thermostat is learning your in and out preferences so that your house can be more efficiently heated in a, in a, in a way that serves your needs. Uh, the, the machine intelligence is the adaptive system that's starting to form that link between human needs and execution within assistive technologies. Cool. Is everyone okay? Is that is that uh, is everyone okay with that message? That's pretty clear. Awesome. Okay. So um, the only problem with me saying all of those things is that probably we still all don't agree on what this thing is, what this intelligence thing is in the first place. Which is why about this time in the talks, and um, I, I I think it's useful to think about this in the context not just of artificial intelligence systems, but also human and other forms of, uh, of intelligent systems. Um, what really are the hallmarks of intelligence? So like maybe rapid fire around, like what's intelligence? What are the hallmarks of intelligence? T, not spilling tea on my foot is clearly one of them. Um, Being able to adapt to different stimulus and environments. Cool. Adaptation. I love adaptation. Absolutely. Also the movement. Very good movie. Um, anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, something simple as like problem solving independently without um, other people helping you out. Cool, yes, definitely, definitely that. Yes, please. Uncritical thinking. 
Ooh, critical thinking. And what do you mean? I'd like, can you unpack that one a little bit more? Do I agree? <laughs> I think it's like when you kind of have a situation and you're able to sort of extrapolate from it. Like it's not just like coming up with numbers or like a pattern. It's like being able to really analyze the situation or analyze like a piece of text or something and like decipher information from it. Cool. Critical thinking. I don't usually hear someone say that, which is why I like that you, you unpack that. Someone else? Anyone else? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Understanding the dynamics of cause and effect. Ooh, cause and effect, that's another great one. Because that is actually something like, hey, I have all this stimulus flowing around me. And then that stimulus changes in some way. And maybe I did something in the middle. I maybe mean, I made a decision. Maybe I, I like wiggled my foot. Maybe I took my teeth. Like, wow, why is my foot wet? This is actually a really interesting, interesting point. It does get to the heart of this. Cool, I like that. Um, yes, please. Being able to apply old information to new stimuli and uh, new problems. So not just having information for that specific scenario, but being able to apply that same um, framework of your answer of whatever you use to solve that problem to a new situation. Excellent. That's really the roots of learning. So that, exactly. I like that a lot. Okay, maybe one more. Has anyone not had a chance to say the thing that they think intelligence is? We can all agree to disagree. Okay, cool. Um, so maybe let me give you one perspective that I think encapsulates everything that, that we just talked about. And um, if not, again, you're, you're totally free to disagree with me on what this intelligence thing is. Um, when I'm talking to people, especially when I'm talking to people from many different disciplines or backgrounds, I like to try and break down intelligence in, in this way. And I find that breaking it down in this particular fashion makes it clear to talk about how an intelligent systems um, technology or a piece of advanced computing is actually interacting with real world problems and real world devices. Uh, and the way that I like to do this is to think about it in terms of data, decisions, and goals. So to very clearly think about what the intelligence is doing in terms of the data that it is taking in, the goals or the things that it's trying to achieve, what it's pursuing, and the decisions that are made to turn that data into goals and how it makes those decisions. Um, and more, more specifically, and this is the bit that, that I've spent a lot of my, my research career studying, is how different, different underlying competencies can take data and turn it into goals through decisions. A, a fundamental piece of this is perception. This is above just sampling from a series of sensors or, or base observations of the world. It's that how does a system represent or structure the knowledge in the world? How does it represent and structure the base information